Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for introductions, and uh, thank you for inviting me also. Um, <clears throat> I guess I realize I'm a complete uh, outlier here because um, <clears throat> we've been hearing about uh, de-immunization all day. And what I'm going to tell you is how to try to achieve the strongest immune response as possible. <laughs> um, I also realize that my talk, I mean, the, my presentation probably doesn't fit best uh, this audience. So I'm probably going to uh, skip a few things and, uh, and concentrate on what you are most interested, which is uh, <coughs> T-cell proliferation. Um, so the topic is about... Uh, DPC-016, so DPC-016 is, uh, is a compound that we are developing <coughs> for the treatment of tauopathies. So ta tauopathies are families of uh, <coughs> neurodegenerative disease which are associated with the aggregations of hyperphosphorylated tau protein into a so-called pair helical filament. And, um, so tau is an interesting protein, uh, also as an antigen, because uh, first of all, it, it's, it's, the function of tau is not fu fully understood, but it's known that it is binding on microtubules and it's very important in the stability of axons on neurons. <coughs> and so the whole idea is that uh, tau is also known to be uh, phosphorylated. And, uh, <clears throat> when it is hyperphosphorylated, it will detach from the microtubules and start aggregating, <clears throat> which will cause uh, a lot of problems. <clears throat> and uh, among these problems, one of them is actually uh, an, ef an effect on um, inflammations. So that's part of this whole idea that uh, these days, there's more and more consensus that in no degenerative disease, there is all the uh, cognitive aspect of the disease, but there's also an important uh, inflammatory component. <clears throat> so tau, uh, it's a protein that comes into uh, six different isoforms based on uh, splicing of uh, the uh, N1 and N2 domain and the R2 domains. So we have six different forms of the proteins. And, um, and this, as I said, this protein is, uh, is known to be phosphorylated. It's a protein that is very rich in uh, serine and threonines. And uh, <coughs> there are a phosphorylation sites all over the sequence of the protein. And in particular, there are two regions of this protein that are very rich in phosphorylation sites. And one of them is the uh, C-terminal regions. <coughs> and so the, uh, the goal of our... Uh, project is to develop a vaccine against tauopathy by uh, targeting the C-terminal regions of tau, and especially hyperphosphorylated tau. So <clears throat> tauopathies, one example of primary tauopathies is a progressive supranuclear palsy, and uh, an example of secondary tauopathies is uh, Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> As you might know, uh, Obviously, there have been a lot of, there have been many uh, publications and clinical trials related to uh, the targeting of A-beta in Alzheimer's disease. But there's more and more uh, interest in the, in the role of uh, the tau proteins in the disease progression in Alzheimer's disease. So the vaccine that we develop <coughs> is a vaccine that is intended to induce a strong TH2 immune response. We are targeting multiple epitopes on the C-terminal region of tau, <coughs> and, and minimum 20 different epitopes. And the whole idea is that we want to induce a strong immune response against the C-terminal region of tau in order to eliminate the toxic species of phosphotal <coughs> that form into oligomers. And, uh, and the whole idea being that these oligomers are spreading from neurons to neurons in a kind of uh, prion-like prion fashion. And this whole idea is that you want to eliminate these phosphotar oligomers before we can spread from neurons to neurons. So <coughs> we have these uh, platforms that we call DEEP. 
And this DEEP platform is uh, designing what we call declensional peptides. So declensional peptides are a mixture of um, antigenic peptides that are manufactured by solid phase peptide synthesis. Usually we like to manufacture peptides that are anywhere between 60 and 80 amino acids in length. These compounds are <coughs> basically amino acid copolymers with antigen specificities. So for those of you who are a little bit familiar with the field of uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, copaxone, which is one of the lead compounds for the treat treatment of MS, is an amino acid copolymer made of four amino acids, tyrosine, glutamic acid, alanine, and lysine in random orders. Copaxone is a compound that is known to induce uh, strong uh, immunosuppressive activities but this compound has no antigen specificity. So a few years ago, we came up with the ideas of designing this type of uh, complex mixtures of peptide by incorporating more than one amino acid at a given position during the process of solid phase peptide manufacturing and adding antigen specificity to it. So the way we made these compounds is that we, in, in particular, incorporate at least 15% of alanine, because we know by, by doing that, we will increase the HLA promiscuity of the peptides, and we will create uh, an EPR effect. And more recently, we also come up with uh, what we call PIMS, which are immunogenic motifs that are short mixtures of peptide, which contain lysine or uh, <coughs> um, yeah, ly lysine in particular, uh, and, and, and by doing that, we know that we are significantly increasing the T cell adjuvant effect of this peptide and activating monocyte. One of the advantages of the technology is that by doing so, we end up with compounds that are very immunogenic without having to use carrier proteins such as KLH. So this is an example of uh, what all these compounds look like when we uh, <coughs> separate them on uh, mass spectrometry. So obviously, normally, when you have uh, a single peptide that you run on the mass spec, you will get a single mass. In our case, what you see is that you get a Gaussian distribution of peptide mixtures, with, which reflect the fact that we have pe peptides that all have the same length, which in that case is 63 amino acids. But because of the alternance of uh, different amino acids at the given positions, plus in particular the in incorporation of alanine, we end up with a mixture of peptides that are all related but different. So in the case of DPC016, which target uh, phosphorylated tau, for instance, at, at particular positions, we will have a phosphoserine or serine without phosphorylation plus alanine, which obviously create these mixtures of thousands of peptides that are related but different. So we, um, we screened different compounds over the last uh, two years based on their solubility and uh, adjuvant effect and ability to induce specific antibodies against specific tau epitopes. And more recently, we come up with this compound, which we call for now 016XX, which is the compound that we intend to bring to the clinic right now. So this is an example of uh, <coughs> immunostaining that we are uh, obtaining with antibodies induced by our compound DPC016. <coughs> so these are basically mice that were uh, immunized by uh, one of our CIO immunity in Canada. So we immunized mice for us. We uh, collected the sera from these mice. The mice were sent to uh, our, one of our collaborators, Christina D'Abramo, at the uh, Feinstein Institute in New York. And she uh, stained uh, samples from uh, human autopsies of patients who die of uh, Alzheimer's disease using the antibody that we induce with our compound in these mice. And what you can see here is that a very strong staining on this uh, hippocampus from this uh, particular subject, 
where you see a very strong staining on the uh, A-beta plaques that also contain some tau proteins and on the uh, <coughs> periodical filaments that uh, accumulate and aggregate in these dying uh, neurons in the form of tangles, which are full of uh, hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. And we are also inducing antibodies against these so-called neuropeal threads, which are these early oligomers that are accumulating in the dendrites of the neurons. And th they are the ones that are containing these oligomers that are spreading from neurons to neurons in patients with tauopathies. So <coughs> we run an efficacy studies in uh, GMPR3 mice. So GMPR3 mice are mice that are expressing the uh, 0 and 4R isoforms of the tau proteins, so the human tau, with uh, a mutations uh, at position 301, which is uh, associated with uh, tau patties in human subject. So this efficacy study was done by our collaborator at the Feinstein Institute. So they, they treated the mice uh, several times for either six or seven injections. The compound was formulated either in incomplete front adjuvant or loaded on uh, polylactic acid particles. <coughs> and so what you see here is that <coughs> when you immunize these mice with our compound, you achieve a very strong uh, TH2 response with very high IgG1 antibody titers, <coughs> very little IgG2 antibody titers, so we clearly have a very strong TH2 bias. And what you can see also is that the immune response tend to be higher in the mice that are immunized with incomplete foreign adjuvant rather than polylactic acid particles. Uh, so in terms of efficacy studies, the way we do it is that uh, we collect the brain from this uh, <coughs> subject, from these mice, and we uh, separate the brain into uh, three sections. The, we have the uh, hindbrain, the hippocampus, and the forebrain, and uh, the cortex. <coughs> and so what we do is that we have a method to quantify the uh, amount of uh, hyperphosphorylated tar that accumulate in the brain of these mice. Uh, <coughs> based on the phosphorylation at different phosphorylation sites. So I, I, will get into, I, I won't get into all the detail, but the bottom line is that what we see when we immunize the mice uh, with uh, DPC-016, that we have a very significant decrease in the quantity of uh, soluble phosphotar <coughs> in the brain of these mice, suggesting that we are, as we expected, eliminating the uh, phosphotar oligo oligomers, which we believe are responsible for the disease process. When we look at the uh, tau aggregation, we also see uh, a significant decrease in the quantity of uh, aggregated tau in the brain of these mice, <coughs> suggesting again that uh, the, antibo the antibody we induce with our vaccines are capable of uh, achieving the effect we want. So, uh, <coughs> again, the whole idea is that um, the whole consensus these days, um, I mean, not consensus, but more and more uh, agreement in the field of Alzheimer's disease is that if you are able to eliminate these uh, phosphotar oligomers, you might be able to interfere on disease progressions, and that which has been shown already in several animal models and uh, remain to be tested, obviously, in humans. So, uh, which brings me to, um, to what I guess uh, you are most, most interested, which is obviously when you develop a vaccine and you don't want to use a carrier protein, you still want to uh, make sure that you have a compound that is uh, capable of inducing antibody response if uh, in most of the subjects, if not all of the subjects. So one way to uh, test this hypothesis is to uh, look at T-cell proliferation assay. So this was an experiment that was performed by uh, ProImmune. So <coughs> they tested for us uh, 22 healthy blood donors that uh, were HLA types. So they run their standard seven-day uh, in vitro assay. 
And so <coughs> what they did for us is that they quantify the percentage of proliferating CD4 and CD8 positive T cells as measured by uh, CFAC labeling and flow cytometry. So we used, we tested four different concentrations of the peptide in PBS. As a positive control, we use uh, Copaxone, which as mentioned is, a, is an amino acid copolymer, which is known to be uh, a very strong uh, T cell activator. And then uh, as part of the IC, Proimmune provided us with uh, controls which are PPD, KLH, uh, H, an HA peptide that is known to be uh, a strong T cell epitope in about 50% uh, of the subject, human, human subject, and uh, a tetanus toxoid peptide, which is considered to be uh, an universal T cell epitope, which also should induce T cell proliferations in the majority of subjects. So this is, a pro this is the uh, proliferation data so on your left, you have the CD4 positive T cell response. On the right, you have the CD8 positive response. So um, <coughs> there are a few comments on, on that slide, which um, I think have uh, <coughs> a greater interest uh, based on the conversation we've been having uh, all day. Um, one, one of them is that, um, as I was discussing with a few people, I mean, it's, it's uh, it always amazed, to, amazed me that uh, I've been working on T cell proliferation assay for 25 years and there's still no consensus on uh, what is the best protocol and what is the best way to uh, in <coughs> measure T cell proliferation. So uh, in that particular case, uh, we are looking at the percentage of proliferating cells. Uh, in some instances, I've been also looking at the uh, at the switch in, uh, at, as a shift in uh, mean fluorescence intensity on, uh, on the CFSC staining, which I found to be also uh, sometime uh, <coughs> an interesting information uh, combined with the percentage of proliferating T cells because it gives you more than just uh, a, a, quantitative, a qualitative effect, but it also gives you sometime <coughs> some uh, interesting information on the uh, quantitative aspect of the proliferation. Um, there's also always a big discussion about the concentration of peptide that, should, that you should be using. So in that part, on that particular slide, I'm showing you only the 7.5 micromolar because that's the concentration that gives the best response. But one thing that I find interesting is that I've been using different protocols with different CROs and we find out that actually if we use less peptide, we get a much stronger response. But in that case, uh, in, in, in w when we work with both CROs, we were using serum in the culture medium, whereas in the case of proimmune, they are using an artificial serum. So it, it, again, it's, it's interesting to me that uh, it looks to me that after all these years, we should be able to come up with some kind of consensus that everybody is using the same T cell proliferation. <laughs> I think that would be very useful, especially for those of you who are very interesting in, uh, interested in identifying uh, T cell epitopes and biologics. In anyway, in any case, um, so what, what we see, the, bottom, the, the message in, on that slide is that, uh, as you would expect, Every single subject <coughs> out of these 22 individuals, they all have very strong T cell proliferations to the control PPD, also to KLH, and that's true for both CD4 and CD8 response. <coughs> Copaxone, which is a, which is a well-known again uh, compound with uh, immunosuppressive activities in vivo is capable of inducing a strong CD4 and CD8 response in uh, 18 out of 22 subjects. But obviously what is most interesting to us is that um, the majority of subjects uh, show a significant T cell response to our compound. One thing that I also find interesting is that 
When polyimmune run this assay, we found a very strong proliferation for both CD4 and CD8. Whereas, uh, again, using a different protocol in a different CRO, in the past we found very little CD8 proliferation. And uh, as of today, I still don't know why we have this CD8 proliferation here. But anyway, the one thing is obviously uh, very interesting is that the response that we induced with our compound was significantly stronger on the CD4 side when we compare that to the response with the TT with the tetanus toxoid peptide, which I think is significant because obviously uh, these human subjects have never been exposed to the to our compound C016, <coughs> whereas I assume that the great majority of uh, human subjects were immunized to the tetanus toxoid. So it's good to see that this compound, as we we will hope is capable of inducing a strong T cell response in most of the subjects. Uh, <clears throat> one thing also I find, I find interesting is that, so we, we've been working on this project with the idea that we want to use as little adjuvant as possible. That being said, we are fully aware that uh, when you inject a peptide in a human subject, it will be uh, degraded very quickly. So it's still important to be able to maintain some kind of uh, peptide stability to give enough time to the uh, immune system to detect the peptide, which is the reason why we decided to work with these uh, polylactic acid particles. So one thing that is interesting that we observed on this slide is that this is basically uh, looking at three different concentration of our compound C016 in vitro at 2.5, 0.75, and 0.25 micromolar using either PBS or the same peptide loaded on the PLA particles. What you can see is that at low concentration, you have a better proliferation of the CD4 positive T cells when they are stimulated with the peptide in PBS rather than PLA. But that's because the PLA particle at, at high concentration are actually cytotoxic. So they're actually killing the cells. <laughs> so obviously there's no proliferations. But when you go low in concentration, you lose the cytotoxicity, but you start observing a significant T cell proliferations when the proliferation was actually even below background when using the PBS alone which demonstrate that the PLA particles are doing what we think they should be doing, is that they are facilitating the absorption of the peptide by the antigen-presenting cells and increasing the ability of T cells to detect the peptide and show better proliferation. Which is, when, you t when you're talking about uh, T cell assay to identify um, epitopes on the biologic, for instance, might be interesting to consider using something like a PLA particles as a general process to uh, amplify the, the, the signal and be able to uh, detect uh, T cell epitopes even using a uh, very low concentration of antigen. Which brings me to uh, my last slide. So basically, that's where this compound stands right now. So we have demonstrating the efficacy of the compound. We have demonstrated that the compound can be efficiently loaded on the PLA particles and uh, achieve efficacy. However, the, uh, the PLA particles are not as efficacious as uh, the incomplete friend adjuvant, and obviously, we cannot use uh, incomplete foreign adjuvant in human subject. So one thing that we are considering right now is probably incorporating low concentrations of uh, <coughs> TLR, TLR4 agonists such as MPLA to the PLA particles to be able to um, <coughs> increase the, uh, to enhance the, anti the adjuvant effect and achieve better antibody response. And uh, that's why I'm going to stop. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer you. Thank you.
<laughs> Good questions. Um, we, we haven't measured it, but I mean, the general idea is that um, probably no more than 0.1% of the antibody get into the brain, which is the reason why you need to have achieve a very high antibody response to have enough antibodies crossing the blood-brain barrier. So you, uh, the reason for optimizing your molecule is to enhance the immunogenicity yeah. to a point that Yeah, you yeah exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm the outlier because I want to get as much antibody as I can. Yeah. <laughs> I can help. <laughs> Have you looked at any cytokines uh, that are associated? With the TCR response? Yeah. Yes. So we, we know that these compounds uh, induce, so it's interesting because the observation we made, and I think it's probably true for every peptide, I, mean, I just haven't done it with other peptides, is that if you give um, this peptide without any strong adjuvant, by either subcute or intramuscular administrations, you get a TH2 response. But if you give the, the peptide by a transdermal administration, then you would get a TH1 response. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of work on uh, cytokine and chemokine analysis, even uh, with one of our old compounds that we took into the clinic. and. Uh, at the end of the day, I find out that uh, the chemokine that was most informative was uh, CCR22, or <coughs> also known as NDC, because we found both, uh, actually I think, I think also in monkeys, in fact. <laughs> I think we found in mice, in monkeys, and in humans that uh, the best way to measure the TH2 response with this type of compound, either by in vitro assay or by actually measuring the uh, cytokine, cytokine or chemokine in the plasma was CCR22. Because even years ago when we did the clinical trial with our uh, <coughs> compound for MS, we found that there was, over time, <coughs> we, we could see uh, during the course of, I think it was uh, 12 weeks of dosing, we could see over time an increase in the circulating level of CCR22 in the plasma of MS patient treated with our compound. I'm going to combine two of my favorite topics, immunology and cancer. <laughs> Um, wh when you look at a primary immune response on T cells in humans, you see an increase in PDL1 around day 7 to 10. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about improving your immune response by blocking the PD1 pathway? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one option. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the only thing is that, again, I just. Uh, the, the big, the only big uh, contrast to uh, <coughs> cancer immunotherapy is that I want to stay away as much as possible from any kind of TH1 response. So, uh, which is, as you might know, there was a problem with the uh, A-beta peptide clinical trial that was run, learned, that was run uh, years ago in uh, patient Alzheimer's. So, uh, one of the tricky part is that we want to uh, we want to have as much antibody as possible crossing the blood brain barrier, but at the same time, obviously, we don't want to induce an encephalopathy. So that's a tricky part. Thank you very much. Thank you.